Okay. I'm hoping you can hear me. So I will offer that there have been a number of different tech glitches in getting this webinar together. So there's been everything from login and registration and all of that um, that has been challenging. And then I'm working with a new mic and a new setup and a new computer. So we're going to see how all this goes. There is a Q&A box, and this is going to be important because my new mic I am trying to master, and it occasionally cuts out. So if you are not hearing me, I want to know about it. But you're going to have to put it through the question and answer um, box if my mic cuts out. So please don't hesitate to do that. Also, of course, that's where you can um, put any questions that you might have. Don't hesitate to do that either. So, all right, I'm glad you are here. And if you're listening on the replay, I am glad you are interested in this and that you want to have an amazing holiday and that uh, hopefully you get some helpful stuff uh, today in this webinar. So I am going to share my screens and or my slides and we will jump in. There are a lot of ridiculous family pictures in here. Not, not super ridiculous and not a super ton, but they exist. So um, definitely uh, keep that in mind. Um, I hope you find them entertaining as I do. So, all right. So we are going to talk about help for the holidays. Today, we are going to um, jump into some strategies, really is what it comes down to. A lot of this comes down to intentionality, but I do want to kind of discuss strategies that you can have so that we can have a great holiday season that you can, you know, maybe start to develop some awareness and also so that you can, um, kind of, uh, Oh, goodness. We can cut the uh, self-sabotaging parts of what happens in the holidays a lot. I do feel like in the holidays, there is a lot of self-sabotaging. And so um, I want to make sure that you have kind of all the skills that you need to, to kind of um, limit that really. Like at more, I think, you know, and we'll talk about this. I think self-sabotaging is more of our brain and our body asking for something that we are not adequately providing for it. And so what that ends up being is self-sabotaging behaviors or utilizing Oreo cookies to provide those things instead of giving our body what we need. So the holiday season can certainly be a trying time. It can certainly be frustrating. It cer certainly can be overwhelming. There's all sorts of things happening here. I think having all the tools that you possibly can have to help get you through this is really imperative and really important. I think everybody, and I agree, like we all want to have a joyful holiday season. I think that getting really clear, these are my babies. These are my twins. Their first, maybe it was their second Christmas. They were so little. It's the last time I think I got my daughter under a dress. <laughs> but, you know, we, this is what we want the holidays to be about. And certainly that smile on my son's face, like everybody should be that happy. Couldn't we all, don't we all want to be as joyful during the holidays as children are during the holidays? But I do think it takes some intentionality to create this. So how do you want to create the intentionality? And I hope that you learn today um, some strategies for creating that intentionality for yourself. I want to make sure that I get to see my audio here because I do know that it is sketchy these days. So, so do you want your holiday, holiday to be about stress and worrying and anxiety? Most people don't, although I do think that a lot of times that is what our holidays fall into. The other side of that, that we believe like, right, like either I get to be stressed, worried, or, you know, freaked out the whole time, or I get to eat all the food I want. And what I offer there is like, that's being checked out entirely and it makes us sicker. And most people don't want that either. So getting really intentional about what does it mean to be joyful in the holidays and how do you create that for yourself? So these are those squirrels, those two little babies grown up. That was a couple of years ago. They were, I don't know, 
14 in this picture, maybe 13. So, um, still a lot of joy with these guys in the holidays for me, at least then. And for me, that's what I want my holidays to be about. I think I advanced too far here. Um, so part of making, oh, no, part of making a good solid plan and a good solid strategy and creating that intentionality means that we have to understand the science behind diabetes and then the tools that we can use. So we're going to talk about the basics about diabetes and kind of understanding type two diabetes and understanding insulin resistance and understanding metabolic health. All of those things are kind of the same. And I want to make sure that we have a good understanding of the science behind that. Um, so that you can make a solid plan and a solid strategy for how you're going to create what you want in the holiday season. So insulin resistance, remember, insulin resistance happens a couple of different ways. There are really two mechanisms, but primarily we get overexposed to insulin over a prolonged period of time, and our cells just stop responding to insulin effectively. This happens in a couple of different ways, but when our cells stop responding to insulin effectively, it allows our blood sugars to climb very high. And when they climb high, that's what we as physicians pick up on laboratory findings as being diabetes. So... This insulin resistance can happen in two mechanisms. One, it's this overexposure on the cell surface level to insulin, or two, it can be faulty signaling within the cell. And I'm hoping, I mean, I keep looking up and trying to find more information about how this happens and how do we reverse that intracellular functioning, that intracellular confusion with the signaling, how do we fix that with our lifestyle modifications? Certainly there are plenty of lifestyle modifications that can fix it because we didn't, we weren't born this way. So, um, there are two mechanisms which with, with which that insulin resistance develops, but what we all know and what is very clear in the medical literature is that eating foods that do not align with our biology processed foods, highly processed foods, foods that aren't natural to human beings, those are the things that cause insulin resistance, hands down. So remember that the food we are eating is causing our body to have insulin resistance. It causes us to make insulin, too much insulin. And of course, insulin resistance happens when we've made so much insulin that our body stops responding to it. The foods that we eat cause this, and it is a normal response to foods that are not normal to a human being. It is not a genetic malfunction. Nothing has happened. We are not broken. You are not broken. Humans aren't broken. This is just a normal response to eating foods that are not normal to human beings. My speaker has broken out here. We are going to change something here. I apologize. I hope this is, give me just one moment. Okay. I hope you can hear me okay here. I'm going to do one other thing before, because we're just going to go ahead and take this hit for the team. Okay, hopefully it's all back and you can hear me okay here. I apologize for that pause. So recognize the standard American diet is what creates this faulty response to insulin, this, um, this abnormal biology. And again, it's a physiologic thing. It is not a, something is broken within our bodies. It's just the way the human body responds to those kinds of foods. So let's talk about the tools. How do we fix insulin resistance? There's a lot of different ways to fix insulin resistance, but these are gonna be the strategies that you can use for making a plan to kind of get through the holidays effectively, okay? Or without getting sicker at the end of it, right? So first, cleaning up your diet and using it strategically during the holiday season. I made fudge, my grandmother's fudge recipe, which means that I tasted fudge and I've had pieces of fudge over the last week or so as I am prepping it for family to go, to go with family somewhere or however it's getting prepped to go. I've had fudge is what it comes down to. 
cleaning up your diet needs to be used in a strategic way during the holiday system it's season, but it's going to have to be used. So for me, and we'll talk about this a little bit, but for me, like I'm not going to waste my time with Christmas candies from Hershey's that are at the office, you know, on a table that can be gotten anywhere or something similar all year long can be found. I'm not wasting my time with that. But when I make grandma's fudge in that recipe, I'm going to take that opportunity because I don't make it all year long and it's not available to me. I could make it if I wanted to, but I don't. And so I will have those foods in that moment, but I will clean up my diet and avoid processed foods in other situations. Intermittent fasting is another really powerful strategy that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about exercise as a strategy. We're going to talk about stress management and sleep. And again, these are strategies that you're going to use when you are making your plan to manage your health during the holidays. Recognize, you know, I talk a lot about nutritional ketosis. If you're interested in managing your type 2 diabetes during the holiday, nutritional ketosis is going to be challenging because it's hard to get into ketosis if you're having some kind of um, holiday treat multiple times during the week. That gets challenging. So I want to talk today about strategies that you can use in the holiday season when you are maybe indulging more frequently than you usually do. So again, cleaning up your diet is avoiding processed foods. When food is processed, it alters. We alter the ratio of nutrients. When we alter those ratios, that ratio, our body, what it happens is we end up concentrating the carbohydrate component. When we concentrate that carbohydrate component, it increases our insulin resist, or release. And that insulin release, of course, leads to insulin resistance. Other things that are leading to insulin resistance that occur with processed foods are certain things that are added to it. So um, certain oils, vegetable oil, canola oil, corn oil, all of those. Um, some other very inflammatory oils, they're, they're thought to maybe be part of what's happening on that intracellular level to um, negatively impact our insulin function inside the cell and lead to insulin resistance. So making sure that you are um, eating foods in their natural form and avoiding processed foods. Processed foods make the human body sick is really what it comes down to. And avoiding them because they make the human body sick is kind of a baseline of this. Another tool that we can use, the second tool is intermittent fasting. When we fast, our bodies are not, our cells are not exposed to insulin and it allows the cells to heal up and we don't have to continue to damage our cells and they can get this opportunity to heal. Once they heal enough, they start responding to insulin appropriately and your body starts managing foods more effectively. So intermittent fasting, again, is you're eating during a certain window. You have an eating window and a fasting window. The fasting window are the hours of the day where you're not eating. The eating window are the hours of the day where you're stimulating insulin. You're consuming food and that stimulates insulin. You can see when you're doing a 16 hour fast, once your insulin level comes down to the baseline to like not having a ton of it floating around, that is all the hours that your cells get to heal from being exposed to insulin. When you're eating, your cells are exposed to insulin and that is your cells can't heal up during that time. So this is a really powerful tool, especially during the holidays. If you're going to a family dinner, if you're going to a party, if you know there's going to be some delicious treat that you want to have, then having the, you know, fasting window or having the fasting time to allow your cells to heal up is a very powerful tool in that. Exercise. I'm coming back on with this. I'm so sorry. It's so frustrating with this microphone. It's a very nice microphone, but it cuts out on me um, on occasion. Okay, there we go. So exercise is a super powerful tool. It's a third tool that I'm talking about, and it's very, very powerful in managing insulin resistance. And more than that, in stimulating insulin sensitivity on a cellular level, okay? 
So when this is a picture of me running a marathon, um, many years ago, it's the only marathon I ever ran. And I don't intend to do another one unless I'm really compelled, like by a fun environment. But, um, when we exercise, when our muscles are exercising to the point that we're getting sweaty, it allows our cells to bring glucose inside in a way that does not rely on insulin. Okay. So you're not needing insulin, which means it doesn't matter how insulin resistant your cells are, your body, your cells are going to bring that glucose in and burn it off, which lowers your blood sugar, which is awesome and doesn't stimulate more insulin resistance. When you're not exercising or not having the effects of exercise on your cells, what ends up happening is your cells have to have an overload of insulin, right? Like they have to be shouted out. There has to be a, enough insulin in your system to override the threshold of insulin resistance that you've developed, okay? And what that increased amount of insulin in your system does is causes your cells then to be more insulin resistance or resistant. The power of exercise is it doesn't matter how insulin resistant your cells are because your body, your muscles are going to bring glucose inside and burn it as energy in a way that doesn't use that insulin. So you're not making more insulin and creating more insulin resistance and you're bringing your blood sugars down. Exercise is such an incredibly powerful tool to use to stimulate insulin sensitivity, to reverse, right? The, the other way of saying insulin sensitivity is that we are reversing insulin resistance. So there's an immediate improvement, of course, in your blood sugars because you're burning that sugar off. But then there's this chronic improvement in insulin sensitivity. And you'll see that in better fasting blood sugars. So exercise is a great, super powerful tool. I always tell you though, you know, you can't like, there's no amount of exercise that you're going to do that's going to make eating pop tarts fabulous. There's no amount of fasting that you're going to do that's going to make you eating pop tarts fast fabulous. You're going to have to control the things that you bring into your body. But when you're making a intentional decision to eat grandma's fudge fasting is a way that you can help lower the effect of that on your insulin resistance exercise is a way you can do that and then stress management is a super powerful way to do that that people don't understand right stress in our body whether it's a physical stress meaning you're sick or you hurt yourself or whether it's a psychological stress because you're stressed out about money, because you're stressed out about work, because you're overwhelmed with things, those all of those stressors stimulate our sympathetic nervous system. That's your fight or flight nervous system. And what that does is it produces a ton of hormones into your system that cause your body to make glucose. Okay. And then you have these elevated glucose concentrations in your bloodstream, which tells your pancreas to make more insulin. And that insulin worsens your insulin resistance. Okay. So learning how to manage stress is a super powerful tool. And because the holidays are riddled with stress, sometimes it is a very powerful tool to implement during the holidays so that you can get some, it's just another tool to get a leg up on your insulin resistance and your blood sugars. So there are breathing meditations and then there are moving meditations. So like yoga, um, Tai Chi is a moving meditation. And then there's just straight meditation, right? Like breathing meditations where you sit on a pillow or you sit on a chair and you do meditation. And there are a couple different ways to do this. You can use an app. I use the Calm app. You can use the Headspace app. There's a million other apps. I have no, I'm not reimbursed by them for telling you guys about them. But any of those um, meditation apps are very, very helpful for managing stress and for bringing it down. So recognize that meditation is about concentrating on your body. And really, I always talk about getting out of your brain, getting out of your head and getting into your body is going to allow you to figure out what else is going on. Sometimes it's, it's amazing how powerful our brain is that we can get so consumed with what is going on inside our brain that we forget that there's a whole nother part of us that's happening that isn't having that experience that's happening in the brain. So it's a concentration on the body. It's a concentration on breathing. It's 
intended to move from distressed to de-stressed. There is an element frequently that they will talk about forgiveness and gratitude. Like that is all frequently those are wrapped up in meditative practices and incredibly helpful. So how it works is when we meditate, when we're focused on our breathing, it allows our parasympathetic, parasympathetic system to turn on. That's your resting nervous system versus the sympathetic system that makes the glucose in your bloodstream and turns on insulin production. That is your sympathetic nervous system. That sympathetic nervous system is what turns on the production of glucose. You can't have it on and the parasympathetic system on. It's a seesaw. When one's up, the other is down. Okay. So if you can find a way and meditation is that way to turn on your parasympathetic nervous system, you're turning off that sympathetic system. And of course, that also turns off the stress hormones that are coming from turning on your sympathetic nervous system. So that's how meditation is helpful to managing your blood sugars. There is tons of ways to do it. And there's tons of evidence out there that it helps your blood sugars. The last tool I want to talk about is sleep and sleep is super, super powerful. And again, there's tons of research out there talking about how poor sleep leads to insulin resistance. It causes your cells to be poorly sensitive, like you lose insulin sensitivity. You also have an increase in other hormones that lead to hungry and you're not hungry for carrot sticks. You're hungry only for chips and chocolate. Okay. So making sure that you're getting adequate sleep, give, and a lot of times this is like giving your body opportunity, sleep opportunity. How much time are you giving yourself to sleep? A lot of times during the holidays, it's very, very easy to skimp on that sleep because you got so much going on. And of course, this creates more insulin resistance, which means the impact of grandma's fudge is just that much higher. Okay. The human being needs seven to nine hours of sleep. If you're a human being watching this, you also need seven to nine hours of sleep a night, giving yourself ample opportunity. Sometimes we can, it's not like we turn on a light switch and we go to sleep. It's not that simple. And I understand that, but do understand that if you are not giving yourself enough time in bed to sleep, that's always going to be step number one. I like to believe for myself that laying in bed awake is more restful than being anywhere else if I can't be asleep, right? Like if I can't be asleep, that's the most stressful. But laying in bed is the next best thing. And that's going to give my body the physical rest it needs. So I don't get stressed out when I can't sleep and I just lay in bed. And that's not true. I still get stressed out about it. But I do try to remind myself that laying in bed, resting is the next best thing to being asleep. And it's helpful to manage your insulin resistance. Actually, there are a number of studies out there that show sleep deprivation for only one week can stimulate insulin resistance, like the kind of insulin resistance that is um, like it will move your A1C into the pre-diabetic range. So from a normal range to a pre-diabetic range, all just based on sleep, not changing your diet at all. So that's pretty powerful. Sleep is pretty powerful. All right. So let's talk about the three things that we really came here to talk about, right? We have five strategies that can help with the holiday season. How do we implement them? That's a plan, right? That's where we're going to, that's the plan we want to talk about. Okay. We're going to talk about making a plan. We're going to talk about developing mental awareness. And then we're going to talk also about um, avoiding self-sabotage. So I love, I, I looked this up. I love, I use this on my kids, this, <laughs> this saying all the time. And apparently it's been attributed to Louis Pasteur, but luck favors the prepared, right? And I always tell my kids, luck favors the well-prepared. And my son's like, no, luck just happens. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Luck happens more to the people who are well-prepared. And apparently the way Louis Pasteur said it was luck favors the well-prepared mind. So Let's talk about making a plan. A plan is being a well-prepared person or a well-prepared mind. This is the number one thing that you can do to manage your health during the holidays, okay? Write it down, get a piece of paper, get a journal, however that works for you, and write down the plan that you have for the holidays. So you have five tools that we've presented that you can utilize, I always recommend you look at all of the events that you have available to you or that you intend to go to, right? Like maybe all that you 
have available? And then which ones do you want to go to? Yes or no. I want to go to that one. I don't want to go to this one. I'm going to graciously decline that invite. I'm going to accept this invite. Some of us find that the holidays can be just jam packed with invites and we can't say yes to all of them. So I would get and why? Because then you're not getting your sleep, right? I would be really clear about which ones you're actually wanting to go to. That's number one. Okay. And then you make a plan for each of those events. Like, how do I want to handle food? I'm going to this party. It's going to have party food. There's going to, for me, this is always a no brainer. If you like Chex Mix is never on the table for me and M&Ms, I've had enough M&Ms in a lifetime. I don't need any more of the green and red M&Ms. What are the things making a plan for the food you want to indulge in, in those events, Christmas cookies, I could take or leave store-bought cookies are always a no. Um, so what are the things that you are wanting to indulge in and what's your plan for them? Make a plan for each of these events. And then the next step of the plan is to decide how you use the five tools we just talked about, right? The cleaning up your diet, the intermittent fasting, the exercise, the stress management, and the sleep. How are you going to use those five tools to lower the risk associated with that food that you just ate? Okay. Are you going to fast all day before you go to your family dinner? Are you going to exercise in the morning and make sure you're exercising that week before you go to the family dinner? Are you going to make sure you're getting a good night's sleep? What are you going to do? How are you going to utilize these tools? And how are you going to plan to get those into your day when you're having these um, events that you intend to go to or these indulgences you tend to go to? So mental awareness is another one that we need to, um, and part of this is going to be meditation, right? Mental awareness, meditation is a great tool for learning how to be mentally aware because you start to get out of your brain and out of the chaos and the talking, you know, our brain tries to talk us into things and you learn to feel what's in your body. When you see donuts, Christmas donuts in the break room, when you see that, the reason that they sound appealing is because now you have a thought about that. You have a thought. Remember, the brain's a prediction machine. And so it's going to predict something that it, about what it just saw. It saw Christmas donuts. Oh, my God, those look amazing. That's something that your brain predicts. Those are amazing. Those are going to taste so good. That's a prediction, right? They're going to taste good. I love those things. Those are my favorite again, a prediction, they could be filled with like, they could not put the sugar in them, they could put salt in them, you know what I mean? Those are not going to taste good, but your brain's making a prediction about what it knows about donuts. And those predictions come off as thoughts in your brain and they create chaos because there's also a prediction, it's going to make my blood sugar go up. I said, I wasn't going to eat those anymore. These are the things that make me sick. There's this friction that develops and we that those predictions as a whole are transmitted to our body in the form of feelings. Okay. The more mentally aware that we can be about what our brain is telling us, what predictions it's making, and then are they true? Right. Will the donuts be good? Maybe, but they won't only be good. That is not the only truth here. They will also make me sick. And I also, I mean, for me, I would get a stomach ache if I ate all the donuts I saw in my life right? So meditation is a great way to start to learn what happens in your body. Because again, you're getting out of your brain and focusing on your body and your breathing. Pausing strategies are another great way to break habits. And we're going to talk a little bit about habit loops, but pausing strategies. So sometimes this looks like you put a post-it note on the candy jar or a post-it note on the refrigerator or remove the food to a really weird place. Like, right? Like, I can remember keeping pies in the garage. It was cool. It was great. Keep a pie out there. But I had to go all the way outside the garage to get a pie. And that was just weird. Eating in the garage just seems strange, right? So there was a pause that had to happen when I would move the food. Okay. So pausing strategies are really powerful to help kind of give you a second step to give yourself the opportunity to get the curiosity. That is another great tool to use. Why is your brain driving you to want this food? Asking yourself that. For me to take a pause and look at M&Ms, why is my brain driving me to this? My brain is telling me they're going to taste good, but I've had them a million times. I know what they taste like. There's nothing new there. 
And is now the time where I want it? Allowing yourself to get curious and see. The understanding of kind of how the dopamine works in your brain when you're eating these foods is also helpful. Remember, when you eat natural foods, you have a grape, you have an apple, you have a carrot, your brain releases a natural amount of dopamine, and that causes your brain to emphasize the importance, right? It's a, it's a neurotransmitter, it's a hormone. Dopamine is a hormone of motivation, not just feel goodness. There is an element of that, but it motivates you to repeat it by emphasizing the importance based on the amount of dopamine that gets put into your brain. Okay. You naturally desire the foods and then you eat the foods in a way that's natural to your body and keeps your body alive. And then you just have this natural cycle, right? Like nobody's stealing from grandma to get carrots. Nobody's going out of the world. Nobody's eating so many carrots that they're making themselves sick, right? Like I always say this, nobody got diabetes from their apple problem. Nobody got diabetes from their carrot problem, even though those are higher quote unquote carb foods. Okay. What happens is when we process these foods, we concentrate that carbohydrate component, which gives us a concentrated release and over release of dopamine which gives us an overemphasis on the food, a concentrated emphasis on the food, which causes us to have huge desires and cravings and urges to eat them, which causes us to overeat. So if you're not having some of these awareness practices, if you're not practiced at meditation and feeling what's in your body, like, am I even hungry? Why is my brain focusing on donuts when I just had a salad and chicken for lunch? I'm not even hungry. That is getting out of the brain and getting into your body. Okay. Having these pausing, these, you know, pausing practices, like, do I really want that? Is there something else happening here? getting curious about what's happening. Those are the things that have to be implemented to gain some awareness about what's going on in your body. This dopamine cycle creates habit loops, okay? Habit loops, loops happen when there's a trigger, a behavior, and that behavior is rewarded somehow, some way. And almost always it's a neurochemical way, at least with food, okay? So what it looks like when we eat these processed foods, if you can see in this, uh, I hope you can see here, let's see. If you can see in this um, middle of this um, diagram, you can see that there's a trigger and it's really from curiosity, right? Like you may be at a party and there are some cookies that are like made from a different country. And you're like, oh, I wonder what those taste like. Like, what's that about? There's a curiosity and you have the behavior of eating it. But then when dopamine rewards that behavior, suddenly desire is what triggers that. It's no longer the curiosity that's triggering the eating of it. It's the desire. And then you have the behavior, you eat it, and then you get more dopamine released and you drive this bigger desire and excitement and heavy motivation that becomes the trigger. And it's always present. You don't need to see it. Your brain just starts to offer it to you. And again, you eat more of it to try to quench the offer but what you get then is another dopamine release or more dopamine release. And that gives you more excitement, more desire, more of the trigger, more of the motivation to eat it. But now you're starting to get to the point where you're like, I wish I didn't feel so compelled to eat it. So now you have a push pull associated with it. You're like, I want it, but it's bad for me. Like I, I wanted it and eaten it so much that it's created disease in my body. Okay. That is what leads to this out of control eating. Like you eat it anyway, even though you know it's bad. And suddenly now your reward of the dopamine is also turning into your stressor about it. Okay. This is what leads to these addictive pathways, these addictive behaviors, right? Like that is addiction, continuing a behavior, even when you know it's damaging to you even when you know there are negative consequences. And if we're type two diabetic, continuing to eat foods that make us sick, even though we're diabetic and we're having to prick our fingers and look at more medications and see our doctor to help us and we're trying to avoid the outcomes of it, that is an addictive behavior. And the way that this happens is from this habit, this dopamine effect in our brain and then this habit, habit loop. Habit loop. 
So let's talk a little bit before we end here about self-sabotaging behaviors. And again, if there are any questions, don't hesitate to put it into the chat box, Not, or I'm sorry, the question and answer box, because the chat box doesn't work. I hope that my mic is still working. It seems to be, but whoever knows, it kind of just cuts in and out on its own. So let me know if um, there is anything cutting out, but put it into the question and answer box. Okay. So let's talk about self-sabotaging behaviors. If you have never read the book, The Mountain Is You by Brianna Wiest, I highly recommend you do. Her last name is W-E-I-S-T, The Mountain Is You. She talks very clearly about what self-sabotaging behaviors are. And I think she presents it in a very, I mean, like it's an entire book, not just a few minutes of talking about it, but she presents it in a very clear way. Self-sabotaging behaviors develop when you're not giving your body or your brain what it's actually needing. Okay. That's what it comes down to. When you are doing self-sabotaging behaviors, things that you would describe as self-sabotaging behaviors, the question becomes, what am I really needing? So if you're staying up late and watching TV, even though you know it's going to make tomorrow very tired and you're going to be hungry and you're going to be grumpy and you're going to be irritable and you're doing it anyway, that's self-sabotaging, right? Like I'm sabotaging tomorrow at the expense of tonight. The question becomes, what are you actually looking for? Are you looking for entertainment? Maybe. Are you looking to relax? Maybe. Are you looking for some pizzazz in life, some jazz hands? Maybe. And all of that's grand and there is no problem with that. The decision about how do you want to provide it to yourself? And do you, is now the time to provide entertainment or is now the time to go to bed, right? That's the question that comes at hand. So when you're eating foods at work, so say it's two o'clock in the afternoon, you already had lunch, there's still food in your belly from lunch and your brain's like, what we need is chocolate. Chocolate would be the answer to all the things. When your brain offers you that, the question becomes, what are you actually wanting? What is your brain actually needing? And almost always you will find what your brain actually wants is some relaxation, some entertainment, some de-stressing experiences. And your brain believes because of that dopamine release and those habit loops and that kind of addictive pathway that gets triggered with those foods, your brain believes that that food is going to help it. It's going to manage boredom. It's going to make you feel less overwhelmed. It's going to manage stress. And what I want to offer to you is there is nothing about that food that is actually like true entertainment. It's maybe mouth entertainment, maybe, but it comes at a cost. There is nothing about that food that takes anything off of your to-do list or makes your calendar look any different. There is nothing about that food that removes stress. It might remove the desire for the food, but I would offer that if the desire for chocolate was caused by chocolate or fixed by chocolate, only one piece would work, but that's not the case. It takes many, many, many pieces because the chocolate is not actually what we desire. We're desiring something else or we have a belief that the chocolate is more than it is when it does, it isn't because it's not making you desire it any less. So self-sabotage occurs when you're looking for something, your body or your brain. Tiredness is a great example. When your body is looking for something and your brain's like, I think chocolate's going to fix it. I used to do this all the time in residency and training. We always used to do this. I'd get a call in the middle of the night that I needed to go downstairs and admit a patient from the emergency department. And my brain was like, clearly what we need is a cookie from the cafeteria because I am waking up in the middle of the night and I don't have any energy. The fact of the matter is when I don't have energy in the middle of the night because I'm sleepy, sleep is what fixes that, not cookies. Okay. So Hopefully, it seems like my mic is still in. Um, if you have any questions, though, about self-sabotaging or you want to dive deeper into that, I highly recommend The Mountain Is You. Um, I do encourage you, make a plan. Make a plan for your holiday season. I've given you five tools that will help improve your insulin function and your cellular function, improve your blood sugars, improve, improve your insulin resistance, and in general, improve your health. Five tools today we've talked about. Make a plan for how you're going to use them. I would start practicing mental awareness so that you can see what your body actually is looking for, what's really happening. And then 
make sure you're giving your body the things that it actually needs connection, love, sleep, fun, excitement, entertainment, like watch your favorite Christmas movie, listen to your favorite Christmas music. Those are the things that you're probably wanting that you keep turning to chocolate to try to fulfill. How are you going to get the joy that you want from the holidays? Maybe like my baby, my oldest baby isn't coming home for the holiday for Christmas this year. He came home for Thanksgiving and it was wonderful, but him and his family aren't coming home for Christmas. So how am I going to cre create joy when all of the things that bring me joy aren't there? There are ways to do that. I'm going to love on my other babies. I'm going to love on the rest of my family. I'm going to call my son and his family. I'm going to send them gifts. All of these things are things that I enjoy, even when I can't have the most enjoyable thing, which is all of them being together for the holidays. So if anybody has any questions, put it in the Q&A box. Um, pray that my mic hangs out for a little bit. I am going to stop share here. Certainly, if anybody um, picks this up on the replay, you can also, of course, um, put any question and answer or any an questions that you might have in the comment section. Um, I am not seeing anything. I hope you guys have enjoyed this. I hope you found some helpful information. Try it out. You know, we've got like two and a half weeks or I guess we've got a week and a half before the holiday, but try these things out as you go and things that fall apart and don't work well, send me a message. I will help you through as best I can. Okay. There's plenty of opportunity to try some of these strategies out over this holiday season. Set yourself up so that you're not starting January 2nd sicker than you went into December. These are the strategies you can use to do that. I hope you found it helpful. Holler at me with any questions. Delane at DelaneMD.com is my email. You're more than welcome to uh, holler at me that way.